Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Paul aka Muad'Dib's Nuts and in this video we're breaking down Doom Part 2. He who can destroy a thing has the real control of it. Leaving the cinema, you might have some questions, so I thought I'd put together a breakdown explaining some things. In this we're going to cover who the boss baby is and discuss the fate of a character that was sadly cut from the film. We'll also be going over some of the family trees, Fade's child and what could happen with Arrakis. Obviously it's heavy spoilers time, so if you don't want to know then go off and ride a sandworm. I will be doing minor spoilers from Messiah but not the big big reveals, however you have been warned that we, we will be touching on the book. Without the way, thank you for clicking this, now let us get into Doom Part 2. The Prophet, why is that a bad thing? Use it! Because all my visions lead to horror. Because you lose control. Because I gain it. Okay, so the first question you probably have is about Paul's sister, who's teased to us throughout most of the movie. Who is she? Who is she? Where did you find her? Awakened during the Water of Life, she's a fetus we don't meet us, but she has all of the knowledge of her ancestors inside of her. Technically, she's an unborn reverend mother, and because of this, she's also an abomination. Although we don't meet her in the movie per se, we do see her appearing in visions. Elia showed up briefly as a baby in part 1 and we also came face to face with her at one point in the film. This happens during Paul's journey in the desert where he sees a woman being played by Anya Taylor-Joy. This is actually Paul's little sister Alia who originally played a big part in the book. She also appeared in the 84 movie and was the one who ended up killing Baron Harkonnen. Not until you tell them both who I really am. Creepy, creepy kid, and because of this, you can see how it might cause issues, and it seems like they're making her a more malevolent force. I think she always walked the lines of morality in the books, but here yeah, you get far more of a sinister feeling. The Benny actually used to kill kids who'd been born after ingesting the water of life because they weren't really a match for children who grew up like that. Due to them possessing their ancestral memories in the womb, they also don't really have much of their own personalities. It's even theorised they can be possessed by one of their ancestors, and down the line, Ali ends up talking with a big family member. Won't spoil who that is, but it's, it's pretty big, and Ali is definitely a wild card to come into Messiah. She's brutal, deadly, and incredibly cunning, able to enter minds and project images into them. She's someone who's incredibly dangerous, and if you want to know what happens to her, then check out our video Breaking Down Messiah. Also, if you can't wait until then, you can also check out what Ali does in the 84 film. The 4K for that is up on Arrow Films, and we partner with them to bring you some amazing discounts. Just click my link in the description and use the code Heavy Spoilers, and you get 10% off everything site wide. Just go to Arrow, search June, and use the code Heavy Spoilers, and you're gonna get 10% off the 4K, as it was written. Now, another character who had to be cut was unfortunately Howard, played by Stephen McKenley Henderson. Denny Villeneuve said in interviews it was one of the most painful choices, but we do know what happened to him after the fall of Arakeen. The Harkonnens ended up taking him prisoner and he then replaced Peter de Vries. Howard was poisoned with only the Harkonnens having the antidote, and thus he was enslaved to work in their house. However, they didn't count on how cunning he was, and he plotted away, creating a rift within him. He was the one who drove a wedge between Fade and the Baron, and he also influenced the scene that we get. Fade Rother, he's psychotic. The gladiator battle is a big part, and Howard actually had a hand in trying to kill Fade. Howard was the one who made it so the prisoner wasn't drugged, and though Fade got the victory, he, he almost got pretty close. Slowly he schemed away and almost ripped the family apart from within, which was sadly cut out from the movie, though I think it would have been some cool scenes. They may bring him back for Messiah, so again, I don't want to spoil what happens to him in the book. However, he does remain loyal until the end, and if you've read it, then you know exactly what I mean. Sadly, he was cut along with Paul and Chani's son, who died as a baby in an attack on the Fremen. Now, you might wonder if that means Chani's pregnant in the film, but it doesn't seem like that's ever the case. At the end, we see her walking away, and I wonder how she's going to get pulled back. She's clearly turned her back on Paul and the Fremen, and doesn't believe in the prophecy that they've now all succumbed to. However, a bit of a bit of a theory time is all mine, all mine. Theory time is all mine. Chapow. I do think, right, that Chani may have fallen pregnant in the film, and this will be what then makes her go back to Paul. There's a big plot in part 3 about that, and though there's a 12 year time jump, they might just keep the story going. They could then show us Paul's holy war, and then lead us into Messiah from there. 
And you're out in the theory time is all mine, all mine. Theory time is all mine, chap out. All this talk of parentage has something I want to discuss, which is what really happened with Jessica. In the movie, we learn the parents her father and even see as he looks over her. However, you might be wondering who Jessica's mother is, and this is actually a pretty big character. Turns out her mother's reverend mother guy is Helen Maheim, and that the Baron forced himself onto her. Because of this, she ended up cursing him, and this is how he ended up in the shape that we see him in. He's got a degenerative condition, and thus can't really move without the use of his suspensors. It's something that we could explore in Messiah, along with the fate of what happens to Fate's kid. Now she ends up playing a role down the line, and becomes somewhat of a friend to Paul's sister Alia. At a dinner, she and the Fenrings attempt to assassinate Paul, which may be a scene Denny adapts into Messiah. Either way, we're probably going to be getting lots of focus on the Benny, which may make you question where some loyalties lie. The first of that is with Princess Erlan, who's working with them against her own father. This is something that continues down the line with her spying on Paul inside her own house. They're desperate for her to produce an heir with him, and she even slips contraceptives into Chani's food to make sure she doesn't bear his child. As for Jessica, it's clear she's against the Order and will do what's in the best interest of her family. Now you might also wonder if the prophecy's real, and it's something that I've wrestled with myself. There are certain coincidences that seem like they're unnatural, with this mainly tying into Chani. Once Paul drinks the Water of Life, he slips into a near-fatal coma, and it's only upon Chani putting her tears to his lips that the character wakes up. So how could this happen if the prophecy's false, as her name even is tied in directly with it? Well firstly, we have to look at the scene and see what goes on there. Jessica is the one that makes her go to him and she combines her tears with the water of life. Personally, I think it's the water that awakens him and everything else was just a coincidence. This causes him to create a holy war, which now takes us into our next point. That is what happens from here, so if you want some surprises then you better turn off now. Messiah picks up where we already know what happens, so there will be some big spoilers for that. You still here? Right, well anyway, the Holy War does begin, and in the end it wipes out 61 billion. We also have the other houses in the film, and you might be wondering who it is they are. Well the first of these are the Spacing Guild, who are humans that have ingested insane amounts of spice. They're able to fold space itself, and thus this is how humans travel through the universe. The second house is the Bene Gesserit, with House Fenring then being the third. The fourth house is House Carino, which in itself is ruled over by the Emperor. House Arconin's next, with the Atreides as the last, so these are the people that Paul needs to convert. If he can't convert him, then then f**k's gotta go, but as we see, he now controls the spice. He also has enough atomics to destroy the planet, and this would mean the entire universe's economy destabilizes. So the houses are stuck between a rock and a hard place, and in the end, they end up bending the knee. So that's something that we can expect, and hopefully Messiah explains how people get down from the worms. Denny said the book never outlined how they get on, and this was something that he had to come up with. He also stated that they don't really go into how they get down, and that they workshop some ideas about how you would do it. When you see Jessica riding it in her little thing, you, you're probably going to wonder, how, how did she get on? Really hope that they just show people getting flung onto it, and then jumping off and landing safely on a dune, like when Cars and Fast and the Furious are used to land safely. I think though that because the hooks have ropes in them, that, that might show how it gets done. Potentially the rope in it might extend for longer than we see, and this could allow them to rappel down the side. Don't know what they do if the worm's body's swirling along and then it hits somebody. I I'm not getting paid millions of dollars to explain this stuff. You are Denny, so you better bloody nail it, and I hope you guys have enjoyed the video. Obviously leave your comments below. If you've got any other questions, make sure you drop them, and someone smarter than me, they'll probably give you the answers. Please drop a like on the video, and if you want to support the channel as a member of the Spoiler Society, then please click the join button. You get early access to videos every week, and it goes such a long way to helping us out. If you want to get some heavy spoilers merch, you've also got our t-shirt line located below the video that will let you pick up all kinds of tops like our Theory Time on, House of Dragons stuff, Marvel tees, and a lot more. We drop new designs on there all the time too, like me and the boys, so definitely keep an eye out for them, and huge thank you if you pick one up. Now if you want something else to watch, you've got a video breaking down the ending and discussing something in it that you, you might not have noticed. Basically, lots of stuff going on, and yeah, definitely head over there right after this. By the way, thanks for sitting through the video. I've been your host, Paul. You've been the best, and I'll see you next time. Take care. Peace.